All right. <clears throat> where we are, let me uh, go back to where we are. We are in the fourth and final interjection of exhortation that runs from chapter 10, verse 26, down through chapter 13, verse 19. And we're in chapter 11. And beginning in chapter 11, the writer presents the positive example of faithful people in history. And that's always, you know, that's, that's a powerful thing when you go back and you show people examples and that's what he's doing because you remember this, the setting. He's writing to people who are being tempted to turn. And as I've said many times, we're all in some way, shape, or form tempted that way. We are pressured, not necessarily by the same things that were pressuring these people, but we are pressured to abandon Christ and to return to something uh, less worthy, less noble, and our, the world pulls on us like that. And so he's writing to people like that, and I think it, it makes it very relevant to us. And in chapter 11, he's talking about giving the, the uh, positive example of faithful people, and he first describes faith in the opening verse as a confidence in things hoped for. Okay, something I'm hoping for, a confidence in the fulfillment of God's purposes and your promises. And you see that in the examples that he gives. That people act on the basis of, I'm confident that what God has said will come to be. And so that motivates me in the here and now to live because I'm looking at something. I have confidence in the promises of God. And we sing the song, Standing on the Promises and that kind of thing. But this is what he says. So faith, he defines it there, describes faith as, as a confidence in things hoped for. And he says, a conviction of things not seen a conviction about spiritual realities we do not see and about the future. There is a certainty, there is a conviction that is strong enough to animate us in this life, to get us to live that way. And that's one of the key things about faith. As I've said before, you know, a faith that will not animate somebody in this life, will not get them to live consistently with that profession, that's not biblical faith. It has to be something that I trust in so much that I live it. And I've said, you know, that's what Jesus said in, in Luke 6, 46, where he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? You see, if I'm really Lord, well, then that translates into how you live. If there's, if there's genuineness to that con confession, well, then that translates. So he's talking about faith. He describes it that way, and it was for lives lived in such confidence and conviction that the Old, Test Old Testament saints <clears throat> were commended. And then in verses, ch chapter 11, verses 4 through 12, he lists as the first examples of faith, Abel, Enoch, Noah, and Abraham. And then there's an interlude, verses 13 through 16, where he makes the point that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they all died prior to the actual possession of the promised land, prior to the birth of the full multitude of descendants, and prior to the promised blessings of all nations, which is part of this promise that had been given Abraham, they all died before the fulfillment of those things, and yet they lived with faith in the complete fulfillment of those promises. That's how they lived. They were in between the promise and the fulfillment, but how did they live? They lived with complete faith and trust and confidence that God had said that, and that was coming to pass. And I just see this is... I just think about the church... I think about the church, and to me, this is, you know, I say this all the time, this is the heart issue. The rest of the stuff is window dressing. This is the heart issue, is the trust and confidence that we have in the reality of God and his promises. Okay, and then that will animate us, motivate us, we will live consistently with that. That's where we have to go. The rest of the stuff of trying to draw people with these other ancillary things, matters of personal taste where we appeal to people and say, don't you like this? Don't you find this nice? We have to get them to believe the truth of God, Jesus Christ, and that has to be driven home. And part of the reason I think we have more difficulty doing that, as I've said, is because our culture is so supremely contrary to that. Everything about it. Breathing, what you, what you just suck it up. God's not real. That's just something that religious folk just dream up. They're like basically boneheads and ha ha, you know, living in the past kind of thing. We smart people of the 21st century, we understand that that's all not, you know, there's nothing to it. Okay, so there's this tremendous war going on. And this is, what I think, is, is the root thing, living this way. 
their perception of themselves, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their perception of themselves as aliens and sojourners or strangers on earth because their focus and longing was God himself and his city. They lived as strangers here. Why? Because this is not what it's all about. See, there's something beyond this. And they live that way. They didn't just talk it. They live that way. You know, I think about this. Uh, I'm getting off track here, but there's a show that I like. In fact, it's, uh, it's the new Terminator, the television show. I don't know if any of you watch this. But a Sarah Connor Chronicles, and if you know, the, you know, they did movies about this. There's a war in the future. And these robots in the future are fighting humans. And so what they do is they send somebody back into the past to kill the leader, who, the, the kid who grows up to be the leader of the human resistance against the robots. And so the story takes place in, in the present, but they are aware of the future and you see the way they live. Their lives are devoted to what they know, stopping Skynet, because they understand everybody else is in a fog. They don't know what these people know because these people have come back from the future. And so their whole lives are devoted to what? Living in accordance with what they know is the truth of the future. And that's what I think we're called to do. You see, we don't, we don't just say it, we believe it, we know it. We live this way and that's what he's telling them to do. So he goes back and he, he focuses on these examples that he's giving them. They live this way, they, they, they lived... Uh, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they lived, uh, you know, though they're in between the promise and the fulfillment, they live with complete trust in the fulfillment of those promises. They see themselves as aliens or sojourners here because they're looking to the future. They're looking to God and his city. And God is not ashamed to be called their God because they're that way. He's not ashamed to be... That's the, is, isn't God worth that? When God tells you, listen, here is how it is, okay... I understand that you're here, and I understand that you're, you're in this era of difficulty, struggle, stress, this overlap of ages, you're getting the hammer, these people are getting pounded. And you can see them looking, saying, where is the victory of God? We look like we're on the tail end. There are people more powerful than we are. They are oppressing us. They are harming us. They are hurting us. And he says, I have told you something. Okay, I'm not ashamed to be called the God of those who look past this and trust me and say, I'm holding on to you. He's not ashamed to be called their God. Here's what uh, Guthrie, I, I cited this before. All right, here we go. George Guthrie. I read this last week, but I like it, so I'm reading it again. He says, the message to the original hearers must not be missed, for their circumstances must be seen as analogous to that of the patriarchs. Perhaps their current experience of persecution has highlighted the alien nature of their earthly existence. And persecution will do that. You feel like, wait a minute, I'm not part of this world. I'm not somebody who's rising. I'm not somebody the world is championing and holding up and saying, you know, I'm not a Hollywood elite who can live as immorally as possible and our culture will exalt them and say, these people are wonderful. And if you say, no, I find them to be reprobates, you will then be looked, oh, are you judgmental? Okay, so he says, here, he says here, perhaps, you know, their current experience of persecution has highlighted their alien nature of their earthly existence. They cannot perceive the fulfillment of God's promises to them. All they can see is the difficulty of their present crisis. The writer's point is that this is normal for people of faith. The promises of God must be embraced even though their fulfillment lies in the future. Life must be lived in our challenging terrestrial cities in light of a better heavenly country that will be experienced in the future. God is not ashamed of identifying with those who live in this way. And this is our call, okay? As Christians, we are to live this way. Verses 17 through 31 of chapter 11, we're given more examples of faith. Verses 17 through 22, he speaks of the faith of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And then in verses 23 through 31, they speak largely of Moses. And that's where I want to pick back up, and I'm going to repeat a little bit about what I said last week, and then we will uh, we'll go on. But here, I, I, in uh, 1123 through 31, it says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called a son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing instead to be mistreated with the people of God than to have the temporary pleasure of sin 
considering the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the anger of the king, for he persevered as seeing the invisible one. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that the one destroying the firstborn would not touch them. By faith they went through the Red Sea as through dry land, regarding which when the Egyptians made an attempt they were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell after being encircled for seven days. By faith Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient, having welcomed the spies with peace. Okay, you first have here the, the parents of Moses. It was by faith that they, in God's purpose for their child, which was given by something about Moses' appearance, which is described as beautiful, but that's taken as a sign of God's favor. They had some perception that Moses was used in God's purpose, and because of that spiritual insight, they were willing to risk what they risked. Okay, this is by faith. You see, I'm willing to act and work and do based on the things that I understand and reveal about what God is doing. And it's by faith Moses chose to identify with the people of God and what happened because of that? He, he then shares in their mistreatment. He could have had everything, right? He could have had everything being uh, in Pharaoh's house. He could have had all the luxury of that. If he had chose sinfully to ignore the mistreatment of the Israelites, he could have been in Fat City. But he considered that, you know, the reproach of Christ, this reproach, this difficulty that comes from identifying with the people of God, he considered that worth more than the treasures of Egypt. Why did he do that? Okay, why did he do that? He was looking to the reward. What's he doing here? He's accepting difficulty and struggle and hardship in this life. Why? Why didn't he just say this is all there is? I'm going to kick back. I'm going to let them fan me and do whatever else they did. He said, no, I'm going to get in this struggle and I'm going to endure these difficulties and hardships and all these things. Why? Because God has spoken, there's something else happening. That motivated him. That's how he lived, and that's the call, how we are to live. We're to be that way. Then he says here, by faith he left Egypt. Now what I think he's, he's talking about here is that it was by faith that he, he left Egypt in that he by faith was used by God in bringing about Israel's release from Egyptian bondage. He was God's instrument and he was that instrument, he served that purpose because of his faith or through his faith, not fearing the anger of Pharaoh in their encounters. Okay, and you can see that in, in Genesis 10, verses 10 through 12, Genesis 10, 28 and 29. Pharaoh, at a couple of times, he was quite chapped with Moses. Okay, and I've said before, you know, when, when you didn't want to risk the wrath of an ancient king. You know, it just wasn't like this, it wasn't like this society. Well, you, you upset a king, and he sits there, you know, he's got all kinds of due process he's got to go through, and you got rights to sue him and all. No. You mess with the king, and the entire culture would say, you're dead. That's it. Everybody, that's right. You have offended the state. You have offended the king, God's representative. You're dead. Okay, so he's in the struggle. Don't downplay this. But he sits here and he says, look, through faith, he's, he doesn't fear the anger of Pharaoh in their encounters, but he pressed on boldly, and that's how I understand that, persevered as seeing the invisible one. Okay, he had his eyes on God, and that gave him the boldness to endure the anger of Pharaoh in those circumstances so he wouldn't be intimidated, would continue by faith in God to be God's representative in this contest with Pharaoh. You know, Pharaoh's sitting there saying, basically, you know, hey, I'm God. You know, I'm the divine representative. I rule over all this land. Who in the world is this God you're talking about? And, and God says, I'm going to show him. I'm going to show him who, who, he, uh, who I am. And he does. And he's the representative. He's kind of the go-between in this. And it's through faith that he does that. And it's through faith that as God's representative in that contest, ultimately they are, of course, freed. It's his faith in the presence and purpose of God. That was essential in fulfilling his role as God's representative. And that role was part of God's means of freeing the Israelites from Egyptian bondage. And it was by that same faith that Moses, he led the Israelites in keeping the Passover. And in smearing the blood on the door, doorposts so they'd be spared the, the death of the firstborn. Right? He did. Why did he do that? He did that because God had said, listen, 
Here is what's coming. Here is the future. Here is what's happening. He said, that's as good as reality to me. When God says that to me, I know that's happening. So what's he do? I'm smearing that blood. You can see people who don't believe that. They go, what are you doing? Things go on always as they have. What are you doing? He says, no, God has said that he's going to kill the firstborn and that if we do this, our firstborn will be spared. So it is conviction about that that then translates into how we live. This notion of faith as some kind of abstraction is nonsense. Okay, but it's, it seems to have seeped in to religious thinking. So that we can have, oh, I, I believe. As I told you last week, you know, a friend of mine said, no, I believe, you know, I believe uh, died, rose on the third day, the whole nine yards. I'm thinking, come on, man. You don't believe that. You know, I know you. I know how you live. God means nothing to you. So the fact you can say I believe something, see, that, that's not what the Bible means by faith. It means this conviction that is sufficient to translate into how a person lives, and that's what you're seeing here. Okay, it's by faith the Israelites walk through the sea with a wall of water on their left and on their right. Now, how about that? Trusting that God is not going to kill them as he did the Egyptians. You think that's no big deal? Well, go ahead out there. You start venturing out through that water with these walls of water up there, and you're going, hmm, hmm. Is he going to keep these walls up? Is he going to keep maintaining them? And there was what? There was a conviction that God is going to call, give us deliverance. He will keep these walls of water up. And through, in that conviction, that certainty of faith, they walked through there. And of course, when the Egyptians did it, eh, the Egyptians wind up dying. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. In that it was by faith that the Israelites marched around Jericho for seven days which marching was, was the obedience on which God had conditioned the promise to collapse the city's walls. What did God say? He says, listen, here's what will happen in the future that you don't see, but I do. Okay, I'm telling you something. Now, you go ahead and you trust me or you don't. Now, you trust me. You do what I say. When I promise something to you, you do what I say and watch what happens. And they trust him. They do what he says. Walls fall. You know the story. Okay, but that's why he's showing them this. By faith, Rahab the prostitute, knowing that the Lord had given the land to the Israelites. She knew that. You see in Joshua chapter 2, verse 9, well, she hid the spies to protect them. And as a result, she and her family were, of course, spared. All right, so this idea, knowing these things, trusting the invisible, trusting conviction about the things not seen. You understand? This is what it's about. You and I live. That's how we live. That's where we live. That's where these people were living. And what was happening to them? They were being intimidated. And they're saying, uh-oh, you know, I'm starting not to really trust that God is God. And if you've, you've had difficulties and struggles and you see how that happens. You start to say, I, I really don't know if this is, you know, if God can be relied on for this. Because if he's really in charge and he's really powerful, why am I having difficulty? And you've got people on television all over the place giving the impression to people that, listen, if you become a Christian, God will place a bubble over you. You see, he will spare you from all difficulty, hardship, because you're his. You see, you're his, and he will just shield you from any hardship, and then when something happens, they say, oh, it's because you didn't have enough faith. Okay? I can't tell you that that's nonsense loudly enough. Okay? You see that, that suffering and hardship and the heroic endurance of that is part of faith. It's part of faith, and he's going to, he'll talk about this uh, more in a second. All right, he says in 32 through 38, And what more should I say? For time will fail me to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about both David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edges of the sword, were made strong from weakness, became mighty in war, put armies of foreigners to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection, but others were tortured, not accepting release, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others received the trial of mockings and whippings and even of chains in prison. 
They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They died by murder of the sword. They went about in sheepskins and in skins of goats, being destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and the mountains and in caves and the holes in the ground. You know, I look at my life, you know, I look at my life and I say, you talk about a cush ride. You know, I live here in America. As I joked before, I had a friend years ago used to call me the Earl of Comfort. You know, I, I, you know, I, got, my every, I got my air-conditioned stuff, everything. And I'm looking here at what some of these, these people of faith have endured. And we stand on their shoulders. See, these people are in our spiritual lineage. And you see the kind of people they are. I mean, you know, if something happens, I don't want to, you know, I can't do that. You know, I have to lie here because, you know, it means my job. You say, well, God wants you to lie? Well, of course he doesn't want me to lie, but he'd understand because it's my job. Come on! What would he understand? He'd understand faithfulness. I'll suffer for him. If it means losing my job, I'll lose my job. Am I, isn't that right? Okay, you know, it, it looks right. I'm convinced it's right. And this is how, see, so you look at what the people have endured. Okay, he says it would take too long to detail the other men and women of faith under the old covenant. So the author, he gives examples of six individuals from the time of the judges through the united monarchy. And then he adds the general category and the prophets. Okay, he's just going to give you a sampling because he says, I can't go on because there are too many of them. Okay, but he gives us, he gives us those six in, individuals in this general category, the prophet, prophets. He says, through faith, these men, that they experienced great triumphs in God's cause. Now, you know that, right? I mean, you've read the Old Testament. Great triumphs in God's cause. He summarizes those triumphs in verses 33 through the first part of 35. Great triumphs they experienced. But through that same faith, others experienced and endured great hardship and suffering. And he summarizes that in the second part of verse 35 through verse 38. Yes, there were great triumphs. But there was also tremendous hardship and suffering through the same faith. Through the same faith. So the idea that somehow faith will insulate me from life in this fallen world is just crazy. Okay? And yet we have people, no, 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 you, you, no, no, no. You, you're going to go on to victory and you'll be immune from every disease and all this kind of stuff. And if you get it, as I say, then it's your faith. You've got a problem with your faith. But look at what he's saying here. These men, by faith, they had numerous military victories, right? I mean, they, they, you know the stories. By faith, they were given all kinds of victories. They governed people and they saw various divine promises fulfilled. It was through faith that the prophet Daniel was unharmed by the lions. You know, right? What's Daniel? Daniel says, listen, uh, you know, I know this stuff. So they got these edicts against me. I'm praying, baby. I'm praying. And what happens? He says, hey, you know, I'm praying. They're going, they're going to throw me to the lions. They throw me to the lions. And they throw him to the lions. And what happens? He's unharmed. He's delivered by God. Because he didn't sit here and say, well... Uh-oh, I think, you know, as I judge this, this looks like a bad move for me. So God would really want me alive. Uh, yeah, you know. In fact, i got to tell you, John told me, Brother John, he's over in the other class. He'd do anything to get out of here, you know. But uh, <laughs> he told me uh, a few weeks ago that uh, he was having a study many years ago. He and another guy, a guy named Clayton Hartline. They were studying with a Chinese guy. And they were, they were emphasizing to him the commitment that Christ calls a person to. You know, Christ calls you to come and die, to surrender everything. He has to be Lord of everything. And so they asked this guy, they said, would you be willing to die for Jesus? And he looked at him, he said, are you crazy? <laughs> he said, what are you, crazy? And I think that reflects our world and our culture. But here's Daniel. What happened to Daniel? Daniel said, you know, he could have figured that out and said, well, no, you know, I thank God. I can do more good for God alive, so I don't think. But Daniel said, listen, I'm praying thrown to the lions, God keeps him unharmed, and his associates, of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're untouched by the flames of Nebuchadnezzar's furnace. I always love that. They don't even smell like smoke. If God wants to keep a particle, and you know, just a particle of stuff off you, he keep it off you. 
Okay, so he says he, he's using these things saying, listen, there were great victories won through faith. And he wants them to see that. David and several prophets, including Elijah, Elisha, and Jeremiah, they escaped the edge of the sword. Men like Gideon, who was fearful. You remember the story? Gideon was afraid. Men like Samson, who was captive and blind at the end of his life. They were made strong despite their weakness. Okay, you have people like that. Through the faith of the prophets Elijah and Elisha, the widow of Zarephath and the Shunammite woman. That's a tongue twister. She received back, they received back their sons from the dead. Okay, so you see this, this example. He's pointing them to of these great victories. And whereas faith brought triumphs, in the world, it also brought suffering and the heroic endurance of it. And he's telling these people you see who are enduring suffering and who are thinking, uh-oh, I think this is a sign that we backed the wrong horse. And he's wanting them to see, no, that's not it. No wrong horse. God is God. People have suffered for the faith before you came here and they'll suffer for the faith after you're gone. What are you thinking? Yes, there are victories to be had. Yes, there are all these things. But there's also the heroic endurance of suffering in the name of Christ. Right? Living radiantly through the difficulties of this world. For all that this world... Just open your eyes and look at what happens in this world. Look at the suffering. Look at the sorrow. Look at the pain. If you've been involved with people any length of time, you've seen stuff that'll break your heart. Okay? No bubbles. Life in this world. And there is suffering. And these people are being tempted to, to go back. And he says, listen, you know, that's there, you have examples. Yes, there were triumphs. Okay? 33 through 35, first part. But there was also this heroic endurance of suffering, 35 through 38. The women of the first part of 35, they received back their sons from the dead by a temporary resurrection that left their sons still subject to death. But there were other people in Jewish history who, when being tortured, they refused to be released at the cost of denying their faith, renouncing their faith, so that they might share in a better resurrection, the end-time resurrection, in which one is raised no longer subject to death. You see, the widow of Zarephath, the Shunammite woman, their sons are brought back, still subject to death. They were raised, resurrected, but subject to death. But there is a resurrection coming. Whereas in Romans 6, 9, Christ, death, no longer has mastery over him. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23, he is the first fruits. So here you have people in Jewish history who, being tortured refuse to be freed if it meant I had to renounce my faith. Now think about that. What do you think God is saying? Now if you say these kinds of things, what does our culture say? Our culture, you're going crazy. That's way too, you, know, you can't, you know. Again, John had something many years ago said, listen, you're taking that book too seriously. I want to take the book seriously because I'm convinced it's the word of God. Right? And what is he saying here? These people who they're being tortured say, hey, renounce your faith and I'll let you go. I'll give you a pass. And they said, no, we're looking for a better resurrection. You see, we're looking for something beyond this. And so we're not going to do it. Now, I, you know, to talk like that, people say, well, you think you're that big of a deal? Look, all I say about that is I know what is right and I pray that God will give me the power if he ever puts me in such a circumstance that I will honor him rather than dishonor him. Okay, I pray that he will give me that power. Because as I look at myself, mm, okay, not the bravest of people, not the greatest at enduring pain, I just hope, that's my, my trust, is that he will empower me to endure this kind of thing. And history's littered with it. Okay, I've read to you at times past, you know, some of the people in the early church who were just, just brutalized, and they maintain their confession. But anyway, he says, he's talking about this. Now, he probably has in mind here, you're thinking, well, who are these people who are being tortured and they refuse to renounce their faith so that they would be released so that they obtain a better, better resurrection? 
he probably has in mind certain martyrs during the Maccabean Revolt. Okay, probably has in mind certain martyrs in the Maccabean Revolt, specifically Eliezer and the seven brothers and their mother, okay, whose stories are recounted in 2 Maccabees chapter 6 and 7 and 4 Maccabees chapters 5 through 12. No, those aren't in your Bible. Okay, they're part of intertestamental Jewish literature. Those are writings dating from the early 2nd century B.C. to the early 1st century A.D. Okay, some wiggle room and how late, how late you date the, the, the uh, newest of them. Okay, but these were stories about what happened during the Maccabean Revolt, and these things were very prominent in Jewish society at the time. These stories were well known. Okay, and you've got some tremendous uh, things of faith here. Let me read what Tagner's quote here. It's of great importance for the readers and for all Christians to understand that the life of faith does not always involve success by the world's standards. This is what I was on before, okay? The faithful person does not always experience deliverance. Faith and suffering are not incompatible. Faith, however, sanctifies suffering, and there is in the midst of apparent defeat the appropriation of the promise of the future. I said that in a much uh, longer deal, but that's what I was trying to say. You see, there's something about trusting and hoping and knowing about God and his deliverance. Now, What's going on? Who is he referring to in these things? I mentioned he's probably talking about these martyrs from the Maccabean Revolt. Hagner continues, the author, the author offers his readers no guarantee of an easy Christianity. Okay, well, that's true, and that's, again, the bubble idea. If in their struggle against sin they have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood, meaning being killed, as the author will say in chapter 12, verse 4, there can be no assurance that they may not yet have to do so. Again, how does this strike us? In, in 21st century America, you know, it just strikes us as alien. Come on. The very idea that someone would be called to lose their life because of Jesus Christ? Now, if that were true, I want you to just thought experiment. If that were true, what do you think would happen to the churches? You don't have to answer, but I'm just saying, you know, just think about it. If that were true, I think the churches, the, you know, there would be a lot of, you know, I think you'd see a lot of people hanging around that might surprise you. And I think you'd see a lot of people gone that might surprise you. But I do think it would have, it would have quite an effect. He says, the immediate temporal outcome, which, which after all can only be temporary, is not the important thing. Faith is what finally matters. Coaster. Here we go. Okay. He says, among those who were tortured, because I'm, I'm suggesting to you that he's referring to people from this Maccabean revolt. Coaster says, among those who were tortured was the aged martyr Eliezer, who was told that he would be released from death if he violated the law by eating pork. When he refused, he was beaten to death. Seven brothers were martyred after him, each by hideous means. Voicing hope for a superior resurrection, they declared that the king of the universe will raise us up to an everlasting renewal of life. So when he's talking about this, you see, he's talking about most likely, that's the reference that he makes here, let me give you a little background. This is probably uh, doesn't really matter for this, but uh, a quick background of the Maccabean Revolt, since it's an intertestamental thing, and we don't, uh, we don't spend a whole lot of time on that. But Alexander the Great, you've heard of that guy, right? Alexander the Great, you want to know why the New Testament's written in Greek? It's because Alexander the Great was a Greek. And he, around, say, 333, 335 B.C., he comes out of Greece... And he's like, you know, a maniac. This guy's like a tremendous general, and he conquers the Mediterranean world, goes over into Mesopotamia. So he sets up this whole thing, but he dies as a young guy. He dies in 323 B.C. Okay, so then you have, well, what happens to all the turf that he's now collected? He's ruling over this whole thing. He dies, and then there are four generals, and it's divided up for these four generals. Okay, and you have the Ptolemy. Ptolemy I is down here, and he has control. That general has control over Egypt. And you have Seleucus I, who has control over Syria and Mesopotamia. And for a good while, they, they vie for control. Who's going to control Palestine? Okay, well, the Ptolemies from down in Egypt, they control Palestine until 198 B.C. And then the Seleucids take over Palestine in 198. And in 175 B.C., Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes arises and he comes in and he tries to force the Jews to adopt Greek customs to force them by power to do this and they wind up I guess I can put this thing back up they wind up 
uh, you know, this causes a revolt. They're not going to put up with this. And so in 166, we have a revolt, what's, what's known as the, the Maccabean Revolt, that begins in 166. It's known as the Maccabean Revolt because it's named for its prime figure, Judas Maccabeus. And so you have this Jewish revolt that begins in 166. In 142, Simon, he completes the work of his brothers, Judas Maccabeus and Jonathan, and he secures essentially autonomy for Israel, although they're not completely uh, free of Syria's authority and influence. But he sends a, a functional uh, relative autonomy, let me put it that way, and this is known as the Hasmonean period. Okay, And so this is what's going on, and it's in this time that you have this Maccabean revolt and you have these great heroes and these battles, and that's what he's, I, I think he's going back and referring to that. And if that strikes you as odd, you say, well, why is he referring to something like that that's not part of Scripture? Well, we do the same thing. I've done the same thing when I go and refer to non-canonical church history about people, martyrs who've stood strong while being slaughtered. Okay, you know, from Eusebius, the church historian, he writes, he talks about these people, they're getting their heads whacked off with such frequency, the axe blade's getting dull. Well, why am I saying that? I'm saying that because I want you to see the kind of faith people have expressed and exercised in the past. And that's what he's doing. Okay, I think that's what he's referring to. That's what he's doing. He appeals to those heroic acts of faith outside the Old Testament. Now, others, including prophets like Jeremiah, they endured insults, beatings, and imprisonments. I don't want any of that. Okay, you don't want any of that. But if you're put to it, what are you going to do? Like, what if our society gets to the point that says, listen, uh, if you say these certain things, we are going to say that you are an enemy of the society because you're causing trouble and you're making people feel bad and you're not inclusive enough and you're not broad-minded enough and we're going to punish you. Well, what do you do? You say, I must obey God rather than men? Or do you say, okay, I'm quiet. I will cease saying the truth of God into a sin-soaked society because that society is threatening me that if I do, it will punish me. Okay, I don't see these kinds of things as uh, uh, that, that far out. Okay, I don't see them as that far out. But Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, he was stoned to death after prophesying against the people. I'm just going through these things he's describing and telling you that what he's probably alluding to. Okay, you have, you have Zechariah who was stoned to death. You see that in 2 Chronicles 24, verses 20 to 22. Matthew 23, 37, Jesus describes Jerusalem as the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. Now, according to a tradition that is reflected in a writing called the Martyrdom of Isaiah. Okay, now this writing, it was, it's dated no later than the first century A.D., but it reflects a, an older tradition According to that tradition, Isaiah was sawn in two. Okay, so you look, you're thinking, man, look at these people. Look at these people. Then you look at what, you know, if we ask somebody to make something for potluck, they just freak out. <laughs> and I'm thinking, these guys are getting sawn in two. You know? I, I, there's, something, there's something going on. There's something going on. He says that you have that. Now, many prophets in Elijah's day, they were killed by the sword. You see that in 1 Kings 19.10, as was the prophet Uriah in the time of King Jehoiakim. You see that in Jeremiah 26, 20 to 23. Elijah, Elisha, and other prophets, they wore animal skins rather than fine clothes. Okay, this is how they dressed. And their itinerant ministries included their share of destitution, Affliction and mistreatment. Look at these people. Look what they're doing. During Jezebel's persecution, a hundred prophets hid in a cave. You see that in 1 Kings 18.4. Elijah fled into the wilderness. You had the same kind of thing when, when uh, Antiochus IV Epiphanes took Jerusalem. You had people going out and fleeing. I heard that bell. Let me just say this last word here. Faithful Jews, they went out during that time also. And the world was judged... Uh, judged them as what? The world judged them as unworthy, but the reality was what? The world wasn't worthy of them. You see, and that's the message for the people, the faithful, 
Hold on, the world will look at you and like, oh, you poor little, you're just going for this for some kind of illusion, you poor little sap. Okay? The faith holds. The world was not worthy of them. Okay, thank you for coming.